All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another week of Barstool Backstage. We have a lot to talk about this week. Pressing stuff, important stuff, and that's why we needed to call in an expert. From Taylor Watch, we have Kelly Keegs in the building. Kelly, how are you? Hello, hello. I'm doing great. I'm feeling good. I'm really hype about Taylor, as always. I know we're talking 1989 today, but I wore my folklore sweatshirt. I, it's folklore season, okay? I can't. We can't uh, ignore mm-hmm. the fact. So I'm excited to talk about 1989, but let's not forget about folklore too. I couldn't be any more fall attire right now. I'm in like neutral colors. I'm in a stupid oversized fucking flannel. I've fully fallen into like the what the 22 year olds are wearing now. I have totally sold out. Johnny, you told me I sold out before we started. I've sold the fuck out. <laughs> I'm also, just I'm going really, for the Seattle so fishmonger look. Yeah, that's I I feel like I should be like the like a background singer in the head and the heart right now. Like I <laughs> I've, I've realized I'm 32 now. I realize I've gotten old and I need to start paying attention to what the kids are doing. If I had like a big chunky, like dirty white pair of Air Force Ones, I would be like, what's up, my fellow kids? You know what I mean? Like I'm at that point in my life. Like, 100%. I, but listen, that's what's on trend right now. Okay. What are you gonna do? So, sometimes nothing. it's the only thing you can get. Yeah, Dave, what do you got on right now? (laughs) (laughs) We're all here just to try and see what the youths are doing. Uh, Dante will be jumping in. This seems to be a trend now. I just say Dante might be here. I don't fucking know. Uh, And then Gia is also jumping in to talk about 1989, the reissue. There's things we need to talk about about it besides the fact that she did an unbelievable job. And we've kind of put the kibosh on Taylor talk since the whole Travis Kelsey thing happened. And we don't need to get into that Mm because it's fucking everywhere. This is important shit in the music industry we need to talk about. But before we get started, Joe, Keeks, are you and Dante going to actually fist fight at some point? Like the Twitter thing, Dante's taking chirps at you on Twitter. We need to talk about this. Listen, Dante doesn't know what is coming for him. Like, I don't know where, I don't know in what world he's, he's jumping on this, trying to, you know, tell me, tell me to, I, I need an intervention because I'm talking about Taylor Swift so much. Get in, get in your head in the fucking game, Dante. This is what we're talking about. This is happening. Taylor Swift is the music industry. There is no not talking about Taylor Swift. Like, I'll stop talking about Taylor Swift when every day the news cycle isn't 100% Taylor Swift. Like, right. that's you're out of your mind. There's too many things happening to be discussed and just because it all has happened in one person like i would i would talk about it if it were other people but it's happening to her you know what i mean i think well, dante's not- just giving you shit because he needs to make it seem to us like he's like a tough guy right. because when he's done the podcast with us all he does is talk about taylor swift that's so, actually true that's, that's, so that's true. what i'm saying he's he's obsessed with taylor swift i don't know why all of a sudden he's acting like every single chance that he gets that he can post that photo with taylor swift he does yep. it so i don't know why <laughs> that's saying, true shit. you know what i'm saying yes. like so why is he on my ass about this it makes no fucking sense hey gia hey hey we have What's a full terror watch in the building by the way i like the uh the fake I watched an episode yesterday. I like the fake fucking breaking news sounder you guys throw in the beginning now. Thank you. <laughs> Good that's work. our that's our thing. That's that's what makes it. It's a very serious news program dedicated to Taylor Swift. <laughs> we need to get you guys a ticker, like a bottom of the bottom of the thing ticker. I know, just right? Taylor Swift that would be the entire thing. time. We have uh, to do that. That's so funny. We are breaking news on Taylor Swift and talking Taylor Swift on the day that the final Beatles song ever made was dropped. If you don't tell me she's not moving the needle in the fucking music industry. You're wrong. Robbie Fox literally just texted me a like 20 page diatribe about the new Beatles song. And we're talking, oh God, here he is. Oh, look who's here. Oh my God. <laughs> He's in the building. I, I'll tell you something. I didn't even know about the Beatles song. That's it, that is sickening. I, I didn't, didn't even know about it me. until 30 minutes ago. Yeah. I, you think I Taylor, do you think it was coincidental? Or you think she's like, I'm just gonna do the biggest like power move I can and try and drop something the same day as the Beatles? <laughs> she's a bad bitch <laughs> like that. Dude, she, she could, respect squ- Paul I mean, she could legitimately squash the Beatles right now. That's how big she is. That's scary. It really is. And it's scary. Yeah. Well, I do want to say this before we get into the Taylor talk. The new Beatles song is awesome. And I never thought I would say that because we had like dystopian level fear that one day they were going to use AI to make new Beatles albums. We had that conversation like six months ago and then they did it kind of like they had the guys play on it and everything but they did augment it to make it seem modern it's mm-hmm. fucking awesome they did an amazing job um well in a was- way it's this is kind of related to the whole taylor swift thing in terms of like ownership of your own uh masters and publishing because luckily the beatles so far managed to retain most of that you know i know there was the big fight with uh michael jackson back in the day with paul mccartney but mm-hmm. like that's so, that's becoming so important now because of what's going to be possible like you want to own that shit so that people aren't fucking it up down the line because they want to get like make another trillion dollars have you ever seen uh anderson pack one of the biggest stars in music has a tattoo on his forearm he got a tattoo all the way down his forearm that says 
if I die, no one has the right to release posthumous music of mine without my family's <laughs> express written consent. Like he got like a legal statement on his. Yeah, it's like a de- like a do not resuscitate order. Yeah, or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, do I like that though. People are look- people are weird about it. They're crazy about it. And I think, um, especially, and I know we're we're gonna talk about it. We might as well bring it up now. The uh, all of these you know record companies all of these agencies whoever it is that are instituting all these new rules that are locking people in as long as 30 years yep. that to me feels like that it's very gross to me I, something about it does not sound right to me any of the because we know a lot of record industry people listen to this podcast if you're from one of the big record labels just turn it off now because i got oh, things yeah. to say and i have i don't give a fuck like i talk to these people every day i don't care like this is important shit within the music industry we need to talk about and i say we get right into it we, we're talking about the re-release of 1989 by taylor swift she's done it with a few of her other albums this is probably her biggest record she could do like to the taylor's version of it 1989 was a cultural fucking landmark me yep. keeks and dante did a it's basically like mock content for a series you want to do down the road where mm-hmm. all we did was talk about 1989 and get hammered and talk about by the way keeks i don't know if you know this i hadn't drank in fucking like six months and i had two of those cocktails by the end of it i was pretty fucked up i'm not gonna lie oh no Uh, i i only stayed with one because one had got me drunk like i was like oh no this is too much when i feel like you guys making more i was like these guys are gonna be slurring and i am not cute when i do that so i cannot (laughs) watch it back and by the end of it the beginning i'm like here are the facts and figures about 1989. How many Grammys did she have? And by the end, I was like, this song's fucking sick, dude. Holy <laughs> yeah. shit. I, was like, I, thought, like, I love this chick, man. I love this chick. I <laughs> thought it was pretty cool that we did that. And then like a month later, she announced she was doing Taylor's version. Yo, uh, the ghost of Dante, yeah. put your fucking camera on. <laughs> yeah, where's your camera? Oh, is my camera not on? <laughs> no, this whole time. Wait, what the fuck? Hold on. Welcome to Barstool Backstage. We don't know what the fuck is going on. Do you? Wait, there he is. What's up, buddy? Yeah, we can see. Oh, it. I'm sorry. I don't know why. I, I I was just on, and then I don't know why I popped off. But no, I was. It was that was a great day. It was a long day. It was a long fucking day. Um, yeah. Cole, shout out to Coleman who did an awesome job helping with all that and chiming in. And uh, we have to get a hold of Don Julio Tequila and see if they'll sponsor it because the fucking shit is great, and we just like morons, but a fake sponsor in the background that we can never use. So, but yeah, the beginning of that video, I was like, very like, this is what we're doing. And then the Philly accent started coming out really bad towards the end. I was like, yo, fucking Taylor's so sick, dude. Holy shit. <laughs> Fire. Uh, but no, let's talk about this because I, we had to have Keegs and Gia on to talk about this because we would have covered it and said how great of a job she did. And I don't understand how she does it so well, but there's music industry implications behind what she's doing right now and the changes that are being instituted. So let's go to Gia and Keegs first. First off, just give me your reaction to the actual re-recording of 1989. Gio, would you like to go first? I feel, I know you feel strongly. Yeah, I mean, first listen all the way through, I was like, this is a masterpiece. Nothing more could be said. It's just everything about the production, her vocals. Each song sounded better than the original, which is very hard to achieve because the originals were so fucking good. It was, it truly brought a tear to my eye. <laughs> yeah, I I felt the exact same. I think I, she's spot on with the the newer songs being better than the old songs. That was something that I don't think with these re-records we've yet to experience. I think that they all hold up. They all sound good. But this one, mm-hmm. I'm listening, you know, I put on Welcome to New York and I'm like this is fucking awesome. Like this sounds <laughs> I heard it on all different, I heard it in, on my laptop. I heard it in a car. I heard it on a nice Bang & Olufsen speaker. Like I did all the all the things. I did all my research and I uh, I can't believe how good it sounds. Well, I'm, the one thing I'm, I'm curious about, and you guys might have more insight on this, but did she get back in the studio with Antonoff and Max Martin and everybody? Or like, I didn't know yes. if she was just as going back. As far as I know, the- right? I think she she brought back everyone. Yeah. She like she used the same people, and and uh, I don't think she added anybody else. I think she strictly called like just Max Martin, uh, Jack Antonoff, and I think I want to say there was one more person. I think um, Aaron Dessner wasn't involved at all, right? Or was he? No, nah, I don't. Wasn't- I don't okay. think so. That's right. Okay, because I remember people talking online about it a little bit, but I was confused. But still, no. And I think it's I think it's unbelievable that she was able to not only recreate but enhance what already existed. I think that that's Mm -hmm. you know. Can I just can I just say like it it is very impressive from a technical standpoint, but also an emotional standpoint because like we've got re-record clauses in our contract. We can't re-record anything for like some number of years. I'm so glad you said this. 
But the thought of actually having to go do it to me is like hell. Yes. I, I don't want to yeah. revisit that shit. No, like I, I love what we, you know, our old recordings and that, but like, I don't want to try to do it again. It would drive me fucking insane. <laughs> well, I think from like a musician standpoint too, like if I was going to go back and redo something, because I've thought about this previously, I want to go back and change things, not do oh, it. Yeah, I would do totally different nuts. versions. I, yeah, 100%. Exactly. That's why, Johnny, I think it's like, you're, I think, the exception to the rule because- I find myself after putting out like a mix or something immediately being like, Oh, should have changed this. Should have done this. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm saying I, I listened to everything. I'm like, we could fix 10,000 things that we didn't do as well as we could do now. I'm just saying to like, go re-record it as it was. I I don't know. It's just like, it would not be, I don't even think it would be possible for me. Think about how much better it would be though. No, no. See, I I, just, Mm. Not with just technology, but with everything you've learned since then. What, what, I don't like, know, man. I think changed. sometimes you capture a certain magic that's intangible at a certain yeah. moment. I'm kind of old school on this. Like, it, it'd be like, even this Beatles song kind of pulls into it for me. Like, I think it's really good, but it is also weird to me because you're capturing like, yeah, a, mo- a mood happened whatever 30 40 years ago now you're mm-hmm. adding from all these different time Agreed. periods to me it like it, it does some th- something weird to it i totally well, get also, it. the taylor thing is like a totally different story like i understand the business the whole story as to like why it was necessary for her to do that but i don't think that you're so wrong on that though because a, one of the main complaints that people have are you know complaints are that they're worried about the the level of emotion behind the songs. I think that that's something yeah. that like he really thinks about having to put yourself back in that space. And for Taylor specifically, a lot of these songs happen when she's younger. She's going through that heartbreak. She's going through these things. And I think Gia, we talked about it about um, on Red. Some of the songs, it's like if she recreates them, they sound great, but you don't really get, you don't always yeah. get that like kick ass that you did when you're singing it from the heart when you're 19 years old. Like it's just a little bit yeah. different. The and- difference with Taylor Swift is, though, that I heard that at each of those critical periods when she was writing those albums originally, she cloned and froze a copy of herself <laughs> and <laughs> was able to capture the exact emotion right. of whatever she was going through at the moment. Hey, babe, but he couldn't is, be her. This yeah. is what I want to ask Kelly and Gia because they're, they're psychos, but <laughs> can you guys, this is what I'm, like, in a weird way, like, I know this is going to sound really like fucking stupid, but I think I'm most impressed by all these Taylor versions by how almost 20 years later, in some cases, she sounds exactly the same. And she's able to now to me, who I'm a pretty big fan, I can't really tell the difference. Yeah. Uh, can you guys, if I played each song and didn't tell you which it was, would you be able to tell? Would you be able to say this is I, the new updated version? I feel like totally yes. I feel like her yeah. voice sounds so different than, of course. Like if you if we're if if we're comparing like Fearless, the mm. original version to Fearless Taylor's version, like she's so think you young. That. Yeah. I feel yeah. like a lot of people actually would be able to do that. I, and I feel like even just like basic Taylor Swift fans would be able to tell because her voice really does sound so different. That I makes you not even mature. a basic Taylor Swift fan, Dante. Dude, yeah, yeah, I, right. I, I think I, and she's right in that though. I think that she, so like a lot of the, when Fearless came out, I was like playing that game. I was trying to see if I could, if I could, you know, tell the difference and you could. And I think that um, as these re-records come out, it's, not as easy to tell like 989 the only way i'd probably be able to tell is just based on the sound quality not so much mm. her voice like as as it continues on it's a little different but i think that like fearless i have no idea how she's going to do debut without it being yeah. different like when what the younger albums i think are it's easier to yeah. tell but really it's just the quality of the song that i think is the is the dead giveaway when it's the taylor version versus yeah the- what really gets me too is i think about this and I think most artists would do this if they could, right? They would go back and own their shit and re-record. Mm-hmm. And the issue one is money and resources. That's the issue in everything within the music industry, right? She has unlimited money, unlimited resources, and the connections to make this happen. I do think that if these new rules aren't instituted, where which we'll get into, more people will do this. And Dude. I think that scares the 
fucking shit out of the music industry. Dude, so I'm I'm Obviously, writing yeah. a, I'm writing a blog on this right now. When Johnny brought up the time period, um, I read this the other day in Variety. Um, I I'm worried now that Keegs is gonna find this and and write it up and beat me to. I won't. I won't. It. I won't take it but, from you. I'll I'll comment on your comment. How about but that? what she's doing now by doing this is scaring the shit out of the music industry and it's changing how these contracts are being written up where the period used to be five to seven years um until you could re-record now these contracts are looking like 30 years which is like fucking pointless that's like unless you're gonna do like a greatest hits like reprise or something that completely it's just the most typical music industry move ever I mean, look, there's another factor in it. Like there's there's a certain threshold only, I think, that people are interested in uh, seeing a re-record. It's like people in the realm of Taylor Swift, you know, like it's those middle range bands. I don't know if anyone needs to hear re-records of that shit, you know? Yeah. But, like, but here's the situation though. So if you're a band, and this is going to sound wild, everybody buckle the fuck up. If you're a band like Creed right now that is having this weird moment where like Hire is the theme song for the fucking Minnesota Vikings, and you're you're a meme now and you're popular again in pop culture after 15 years of being laughed at you could make a quick hundred grand by going back and re-recording higher and re-releasing it just people would listen to it strictly based upon like oh this is cute this is niche this is different like let's hear what they're doing now that's not gonna be able to happen if these new rules are instituted down the line now, then again, are people going to give a fuck based upon like the rate in which artists turn over like in 20, like a TikTok hit, nobody's going to give a fuck in 30 years. If you re-record that and re-release it, like we're playing with kind of the death of legacy acts as it is like nobody lasts long enough to even care about that at this point. So that's another thing. But when you look at an artist like Taylor Swift, and I'm trying to think, is there anybody comparable that would even go back and do this? Like, is, is there realistically? I don't we know. were talking I, about this, Kelly. Like, yeah, feel, right. Like, That's, I don't know if, like, anybody, if anybody would. Sorry, somebody's vacuuming outside. Uh, it's. Uh, I don't know if there is anyone that would would either take the time to do it or feel the passion behind it. But I do think a lot of the of the press and the hype and the fact that the fans are getting behind it is a lot to do with the story about it, how she was right. wronged and how she's reclaiming it. I, I yeah. feel. If a lot of artists now suddenly want to start doing that, I'm not saying that like people will you know will get sick of it, but I also think like okay, how many like it's it's kind of spreading your loyalty out, which is good, but there's so much loyalty funneled into Taylor Swift itself that everybody will do anything that she that she says or does at this point. I also think too that um it's interesting I people who want to listen to re-records and a lot of the time it's like live versions or like at a concert or whatever, which I feel like is a totally different feel. And there are people like, I'll, I like, I'll listen to a live version every once in a while, not so much Taylor, but you know, in general. And I think that it's interesting, the t kind of people that prefer that kind of track versus just like the original. So I think that if people want to do these re-records, re-recording it as like a carbon copy like Taylor might not be as lucrative for them, but if they want to reimagine it in a different way, that might be different. I think Demi Lovato did that. She turned hmm. her whole yeah. album like into a rock album. And I don't know, I don't think it did as well as she had hoped, but it was an interesting concept. And I, I respect the like reimagining of it. Right. And what we're staring at here is the biggest artists in the world re-recording their tracks. That's like the, the draw and the niche of it. And especially someone whose fans will go back and listen to literally every second of every song. Well, yeah, I think it, Kelly put it right in turn. It's got to do with loyalty and spreading that loyalty too thin. Like she's got a lot to play with. Like yeah. if smaller bands, like I know, for instance, if we did that, 90% of our fans would be like, why didn't you just record new music for us to hear? Like, why yeah. the <laughs> fuck do we want to hear you right. trying to do a version of something that you already did as well as you could do it, you know? So, right. but yeah, obviously in her case, like there's a whole different ball game and story. Which is what movement, makes me, you know, it's, it's a movement on its own. Which is what makes me think like this whole conversation is semi frivolous because like we're talking about a once in a generation thing. Like, I, like we'll never see this again, but it's also about, the clamps coming down from the control of the people above her. That's where things get interesting. You can see the fear on the music industry's eyes that somebody's thinking and doing things a different way. That's what to me interests me and what Taylor is doing. At the same like, time, Colin, like I know they're definitely going to be cracking down wherever they can push artists to take shitty deals of, you know, long uh, re-record clauses. 
But then like that shit I sent you earlier this week, like 120,000 songs are coming out every day. It's also like, who fucking cares about anything unless you're talking about these top tier artists. It's like, fine, re-record, who cares? Like you just throw yeah. it into the into the I'm deluge of shit that comes out every day. Completely. It's gonna be too- I wonder- I wonder if there's like a threshold for for this, like, I, or are they presenting those deals, you know, the 30 year deals, 10 year deal, whatever, um, to major artists or like, you know, what's their barometer? Like, where do they, mm. where do they decide like, okay, we're giving you a 30 year deal because we have a feeling that you're going to pop off and we want to like suck every dollar we can out of you versus the smaller artists who maybe aren't quite as big and they get the 10 year deal. But then what if in 10 years, you know, all of a sudden they are, they are Taylor Swift or they are, you know what I mean? Like when, what do they I mean, I think they're going to try and grab as much as they can, as early as they can. Like that's the yeah. record label MO is like, try okay. and take, we will offer you a zero money, a hundred percent control to us deal. They start there and they're like, okay, fine. We'll give you 5%. And it, they work backwards, you know? So I'm sure they're yeah. trying to take as much as they can. When you got artists with, like Taylor and uh, like, she's got the power to say, fuck you. You know? Well, that's what I mean. There's one artist who I'm interested in. I'd love to see her contract, like, because she's recent and she's huge and she's put out two great records. I would love to see Olivia Rodrigo's contract mm-hmm. and see like what that. and see whether or not any of these clauses are in there, because she's the one person I could see from this generation right now a label saying down the road, is she going to redo driver's license? Like but didn't like she, she came up she came up through disney world right she did yeah, yeah. That, like that that universe uh dude her contract's gonna be not very nice looking i would imagine like maybe she's been able to knock away at it you know as she's gotten more and more popular but like when you're coming up through that system i i feel like those are scary ones so but she she started out on a, a show called high school musical the musical the series which is <laughs> a, hilarious and it's honestly a, a funny show well she was she was actually on bizarre Vark first oh god oh, how could i forget about yeah. oh, how could you forget about yeah. the amazing talent pipeline yeah. of bizarre <laughs> right of course yeah. of course With jake paul but- you're right. Jesus you're right. Christ. But she, so, uh, but High School Musical, Musical series. That's what like blew her up. Yeah. Yeah. Blew her up with, with her, you know, her voice and everything. And she played like the Gabriella character for High School Musical. So it was like, she was the, the main character and that show was still filming when Driver's License came out. Like it's, I think it's still wow. on, like it's still going, but when that happened and she blew up so fast and so big, they, she was like weeded out of the show. Like you could tell that like, she wasn't on as many episodes. She only did like a quick appearance. She wasn't on a whole season, but they would talk about her character and whatever, but they like weeded it out. So I wonder if at that point she was like, all right, Disney, like let's, you know, my contract is dwindling and I'm not resigning because I'm about to be a rock star. Like, I was going to say, did they, did they give dude, her character I don't like know, a tragic man. death or something like that? Like, mm-hmm. just, right, right. I just can't Disney's imagine. Def- she's definitely not Disney anymore because she, you know, or she's no. trying very hard to distance. So I don't know. No, if, she's uh, definitely not. Yeah. I don't know what, what. They would never let her like curse and like use right. like, like she, Her and, whole album, yeah. every song has some sort of, you know, implication or, or a, a swear word or whatever in Disney. Yeah. Like but, she's like, I, but, she's like Miley Cyrus a little bit in that way to break out. It's to me though, like you look at it and you say, like, yo, who who would the labels want to get their claws into? Because there's not a band on earth that they give a fuck enough about. Mm-hmm. Maybe like Maniskin, who, by the way, where the fuck did they go? Like, there's no speaking like, rap- of Disney. Yeah, right. It's literally a Disney product. Um, it's to me like that's the one person who I could see them being like, you got 30 years, but she got it before this. Ha- so, like, I don't know. It's the next generation coming up that are gonna feel the effects of this. But does someone like Taylor Swift with enough weight that she holds lean on people enough to say like, yeah, you can't fucking do that. Look at what I did to you the first time. I'll do it again. Like you wanted to fuck with me before. I'll make sure that this shit doesn't happen again. I don't know. But it's like Like, people like you. So Colin, let's ask this question here. I'll I'll give you a 500,000 to two record contract, but we want uh, 30 years of no record. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm saying. Like you (laughs) most, like most up and coming artists are going to take, pretty much whatever you give them unless they are those very unique unique people who are so confident in what they're doing that they know i can fucking hold out but that is very hard to do when someone puts actual money in front of you and says here take this you're like okay (laughs) well my my question too is like you look at what's going on right now and taylor swift she's still young but she is a member of the old guard of the record industry that she's been around since what like oh five oh six i don't know when the first record came out 
think I want to say like like 08 08 yeah 07, 08. 08. let's see so yeah. that's still CD sales you know what I mean like she her right. original contracts are dated at that point. so if you're a young artist now and you're seeing all this and all the different avenues to get yourself out there and then the control being exerted by labels upon artists why sign a deal at this point I was, just, yeah. I was just about to ask that. And even more so, if you are presented with a deal, say say I'm Olivia Rodrigo. I have these two albums. They, they're out. They're amazing. I have all these fans, blah, blah, blah. And they hand me that 30-year deal. What is stopping someone like her from being like, you know what? I can do this on my own. Like, what is what does what do these record companies offer that make up for the fact that whatever could happen in the future would take away from their own, you know, I well, see, I, I think, well, I think part of the problem is that there's a bit of a myth in people's minds that indie music's actually bigger than it is. And like, we, yeah. we you know, we finally kicked the labels us as like five, 10 years ago. Yeah. And the fact remains that I think it's 70% or more of charting of like the top charting music is still major labels. So like they can offer you something. It's marketing money. It's basically. marketing. Okay. So yeah, here, here's, here's the actual thing. That is uh, two words that I used earlier in the conversation. It's money and it's time. And it's yeah. two things they can give you. Not to mention the fact that a lot of these playlist placements on Spotify and Apple are owned mm -hmm. by these ma major labels. What's the, the biggest Ooh. Avenue yeah, you have point. to go through these labels to get like, you know how many times my band has dropped a song and we went through like the Spotify like playlist pitch and you're sitting there at midnight and you're like, this might be it. You're checking the rock this playlist or you're checking like, and you're like, this is it. I know this is the fucking one. I sent 15 <laughs> emails. I know this is going to happen. And then you refresh the playlist at midnight and you're nowhere to be found. And uh. then you look at the people on there and you're like, who the fuck are these motherfuckers? Dude, Dude have you watched the movie, The Godfather? <laughs> yeah like that it, that explains the music business well you know it's like it's yeah. without without maybe the murder part mostly if you don't know. think there's been a couple bodies dropped in the desert in the music industry you're fucking yeah. sleeping dude um that's such a that's such a good point about the spotify playlist because i i used to listen to new music friday every friday like i would wake yeah, up same. Wake up till midnight on thursday like i would do it all the time and i loved it and now i go on new music friday i can maybe recognize you know, the top 10 songs, I recognize the artists, but none of them are that good. And then everything else is random as fuck. And I don't mm -hmm. know who these people are. I've never, they've never been marketed to me and maybe I'm not in the right space, but it seems, it, they seem like they paid to be there. And I don't want to like diminish they, they their did. work for that, but it does kind of seem like I hear, um, you know, I'll hear songs on, on TikTok, which is annoying, but I'll hear songs on Twitter, I'll hear songs wherever, and I'll expect that they'll blow up and everyone's singing them, whatever. And then I can't, I don't see it on New Music Friday for a month and a half. I'm yep. like, that's kind of crazy. Uh, if you really want to get fucked up about like payola and different things like that, Johnny, how much does it cost you to get a song on the radio? Oh, no. I don't even know these days, but it was a lot. <laughs> yeah. A lot, it's, and it's, it's, also, it's all the hidden, not, because no one's actually doing payola anymore, but you'll go do a and, show where they're like, and, <laughs> no, I know what I'm saying. What I'm saying, I, everyone is, but it's like they've made it. They've masked it pretty well. Yeah, like you, you go like, hey, come play our uh, Halloween festival. We're not going to pay you. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's so that's like however you... that's what it, whatever your right. fee should be. Well, you just you just paid them. And you know? it's also it's so consolidated now. It's literally Clear Channel and yeah. iHeart yeah. own forty eight percent and forty nine percent of every fucking FM radio station coast to coast. So whatever. Yeah, we would, you know, we would go play all those. It's like the industry little showcases where dude, you're in front mm -hmm. of all the program directors. And it's like, I mean, but look, when it works for you, it's great. You know, it's like, that's the problem is like, if you don't have that corruption, what you have is the fucking machine of the algorithm. And I honestly don't know which is better. Like the old school corrupt, like gatekeeper uh, method or a fucking evil robot that's just like you know <laughs> going up like it's a genuine question in my mind should we just go back to the days of like take a bag of cocaine to the radio station and get your song on the radio i'd, I'd be down for that that'd be fun oh 100 percent, dude what it, I, might, how, I might put out a track if that if that's what it becomes well yeah how do you give cocaine to a robot i, I don't know what their cocaine <laughs> is like okay. so here's one thing johnny and and con will have no clue about and I know Keegs is all over. Uh, one thing Taylor has been doing that has been really fucking cool 
is she's been pressing limited edition vinyls mm. of all uh, these releases and dumping them out to her fan club. Uh, Keeks, were some of the were some of them were some of the midnight ones signed? No, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Stuff I see on Twitter sometimes I don't know what to believe or where people got it from or like what's going on. But as far as I know, you could not buy like a signed record of any kind. Like I, I've not yeah. ever seen that. Um, but I have fallen victim to this multiple times now. I'm currently looking at <laughs> two different 1989 Taylor's version records on my thing. I have a blue one and a pink one. And, you know, God forbid, I only have, why do I have two? It's the same exact record. I have four <laughs> midnights because I bought the clock and I'm going to put it on my wall at some point. It's like, what, you know, you, you, you get wrapped up in this and you get so excited and it just yeah. it feels like a, it, it's become decoration. It's become collection. Like it's become these things. Yeah. Why it's like I a collector's so item. Yeah. This is why we brought you guys here. We've got your parents and we'd yeah. like to sit you down <laughs> and uh, exactly. Have, exactly. have a frank talk about some stuff. Yeah, yeah Dante's got them. Cheeks, I'm with you. I got. I have all four. I'm looking at them right now. I got the blue and the marble mahogany one. And what you don't I, see I, is behind I have that. The jade green. What yeah. you don't see is behind that back door is the giant stuffed taxidermy fake version of Taylor Swift that Dante has hiding <laughs> yeah. in the back of his room. But here's the thing. And she needs to be studied from a marketing perspective and a building a fan base perspective. It's... And I don't know how the fuck she did it, but she, if she chose to, she could draft an army of people to literally work for her for free. <laughs> like yeah. I could see the, we already just, do. We already do. Yeah. She like, yeah. Did. yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's I like yeah. I Taylor Swift is my boss. Like that's that's you it. You guys need to unionize and start fighting for your fucking rights and yeah, demand right. fair pay. No, do you not remember? Like it was it was like I don't, when she was dating Maddie Healy for like that like little stretch. Uh, didn't there was a me. fake thing that went around the internet that was like we as Taylor fans need to unionize to make sure that she doesn't yeah. do this or do that. That was what <laughs> this is. That's that where I. That's when I thought that was real. My dumb fucking caveman brain, and I was yeah. like fuck this shit it needs to be stopped this has gotten too far and i, I don't think that it was fake i think that it was like some crazy people putting that shit together like that was not like a that was not a uh a joke thing but we don't all tell me that like hey what the fuck like this is actually yeah forget like i think people start to feel because they bought the merch because they listen to songs they tweet about it they talk about it they do whatever they can to support her they then feel this ridiculous need to have a say in the way she runs her life or something like that like yeah. they feel they forget that she's a she's an individual not just a, a figurehead not just a character on tv not just a she, she's not written nobody's writing her right. she's a person and it's kind of weird you know when you think about it but then at the same time i'm over here i'm buying six six of the same record well, and well you kind of forget like, the origin of the word fan comes from fanatic, fanatic. like people are Yep. actually crazy about people you know like they'd feel like not just that they have a say over there like they feel like an actual ownership and feel offended if someone then does something outside of what they want and it's dude if she, it's a if delicate kept, balance you know if she kept dating maddie healy there would have been like uh remember those like uh al-qaeda hostage videos where they would stand in a cave in front of a thing and it was like we need taylor to relent this relationship like i could totally yeah. see like fucking legit <laughs> hostage videos for this shit and look i do get tired of the news cycle of taylor swift because i'm not that big of a fan in fact i've said some things on this podcast that she gets on my nerves from time to time i'm not afraid to admit that her fans scare the fuck out of me but that's okay i will never ever 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 shit on the product that she puts out and the level that she's gotten to it's untouchable you can't touch it it's never been seen before yeah. in this modern era but it interests me to no end her ability to say Colin, all right good watch you asked a question and i know where you're going with this how did she build this army and you know they need to teach marketing courses on her it's which yeah. i totally agree which they are by the way they do I, offer, they offer courses in like you know 10 different colleges across the country Bef right now. before i like fell head over heels in love with her i was like this is th like around the red days um i was like yeah whatever you know she's like kind of like like gimmicky whatever like bubblegum country um and then i saw this interview she did on 60 minutes it was right around when red came out and it was like they spent a day with her and she showed literally how she is a team like any artist on any label has a team but 
She handles all her own social media. She's on top of all her own marketing. She is basically dictating to her team what she wants her voice to be. It's not vice versa like everybody else where mm. the label's telling the artist, this is what you need to do. This is how you need to dress. This is like the image we're going for. The complete other way around. And she basically said from, I mean, how old was she when Red came out, Kelly? Uh, Probably early 20s, maybe 21. Yeah, I mean, she laid down the law then and said, like, this is how it's going to be. And if it's not going to be this way, like, I'm not the right fit. I think Dante uh, used an interesting word, place. dictate, because I think 25 years from now, there's going to be <laughs> documentaries about the rise of the cruel and evil dictator Taylor Swift, who, <laughs> who slowly started taking over countries that, you know, didn't want to play her records enough. No, right, but right. I, I saw that and I was I was blown away and I respected the fuck out of it. I was like, here's this like young girl who doesn't give a fuck what these suits have to say. and she wants to be who she wants to be and she wants to do it her way and it's her way or no way yep. and then on top of it she plays nine instruments mm -hmm. she writes all her own shit it's like it was just so rare and i was like holy shit this girl's the complete opposite of fabricated music artists i mean dante uh, kind of sounds like you need an intervention dude <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, do we want to talk about yeah, that? I don't at know. Don't they you know, some weird shit right now. <laughs> no, I'm man. Concerned I... for your well-being. <laughs> no, I, so I, uh, but I've, I've drawn the line. It, I think it might be I'm fucking insanely jealous of Travis Kelsey. Um, it, it could be that. It could be that for sure. I think I too, am, though, but... the, the stuff with Taylor, as far as like, um. I'm trying to think what you like literally what you were just saying oh oh with she has she has this shit to back it up you know what i mean like mm -hmm. she can do what she wants she can she can have people work for her she doesn't work for anybody because she has that talent she has that vision she has those thoughts and she now like undisputably has the shit to back it up and so people trust her vision more than ever and i think that um the only person i've ever really seen her working in tandem with not even like controlled by or anything is her publicist tree pain and we talk about her all the time and there's always jokes about her you know online being like oh tree's not going to be happy when she sees this or trees you know whatever because she is now the one that really uh you know manages the i, I would say the i don't want to the online perception, but she is the most plugged in on it, I think, which mm -hmm. I think is also good for Taylor, because I think in earlier days when Taylor didn't necessarily have the people that she trusted surrounding her, they weren't thinking about how how the fans are going to affect her and her work and how she feels. And then when all that bullshit went down with Kanye West she, and she hid away for a while, I think that she was too exposed to all of the bullshit online when there should have been a buffer there. And I think now she has that where she can still, you know, do, be creative. She's an extremely creative person. She can do all these things and she doesn't have to worry about having to like sit there and read through the comments all the time and and try to gauge the, the temperature on her at the moment because she has someone there who is seeing it, understanding it and molding it in a way that's a little more digestible for her. Great. Yeah. And there, if you watch, um like her Miss Americana documentary on Netflix. I mean, it does like the whole deep dive of like her life before and after all the Kanye stuff. And I think that's what really cemented her. Like, I don't give a fuck how I'm perceived mentality. Like I want to do what I want to do. You know, she like talks about like getting involved with politics and actually using her voice, like for, for whatever reasons that she wants to do. And, you know, she has all these people, including her father, like telling her like, I don't think this is good for your image. I don't think this oh, is yeah. like the path that you want to go down. But she, she basically Miss Americana is about how she spent her whole career being this good girl who had this uh, pop star image, you know, this perfect image and how she wanted to break away from that because she was just like sick of people taking advantage of her basically. Mm. There, there is. A, what does her a... meltdown look like? Everyone's got to have one oh, at some point. Dude. What is that going to look like? Uh, I, th I mean, I think that I think hiding away and not being seen for a year was probably the meltdown. I mean, I she was she's she had was a traveling few. 
in and out of her house inside of suitcases so people couldn't see her. I, I think I, that- Yeah, I also don't think that she gets involved in enough drama and like her lifestyle choices kind of prevent a meltdown. You know, she's not a party girl. She's not a, she's not a wild person or a party guy or hangs out with the wrong crowd or whatever, you know, she has her very small circle and her mom and her, her family still super involved in her life. You know, I think I don't, I don't really ever see any sort of meltdown coming from her just because she, it really seems like she has her head on her shoulders and like, Mm -hmm the way that she she doesn't overexpose herself. I think yeah. she knows where she could dip her toes in when it comes to getting putting her personal life on blast. She can go to a football game and she knows everyone's going to talk about it. But she's not going to like make out with Travis Kelsey in front of everyone right. or like right. you know like take shots and black out like she Boring. she yeah. <laughs> I I do well, she, I, she knows what she's doing. I have to make a reference here in this conversation between you two about the connection between Kanye and Taylor, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keegs, I think you're going to appreciate this. There is a weird Harry Potter-esque connection between (laughs) Taylor Swift and Kanye West. Yes. Where Kanye is kind of Voldemort. Kanye is kind of Voldemort (laughs) and then Taylor is kind of like Harry Potter. there's been this weird like synchronicity between them throughout their career where Kanye is this kind of evil figure lurking in the background. And don't get me wrong. I am not a liar. So I will say this. I am a gigantic Kanye West fan. Not as much now, but I always have been. He's well, like my favorite artist. Now, so watch out. Yes, I know. Trust me. <laughs> yes. I was good until he said I love Hitler. And then I was yes, like, tough. okay, maybe tough I can. not come back from. I, but he's I cannot. He's not well. You know what I mean? He's not well. He's not who he used to be. It's, it's sad. You know, 100%. Yeah. But there is a weird symbiotic relationship there where she does one thing and he does another. There's been checkpoints at different points in their career. Got the it. only person who Kanye has never been able to kind of like get a one up on is Taylor. And I yeah. wonder if there is this weird thing in his mind where he's like, Guys, what? <laughs> it was never Kanye having a vendetta oh. against Taylor Swift. It was Kim Kardashian pulling oh, fucking Here we go. Spring. Yeah. Dude, you listen to well, the no, tape. but you're not going back far enough. You're not, you're not going, going back, back far enough. enough. It's the the he's it's right. OJ about Simpson. I'll go further. It's OJ Simpson. <laughs> I'll draw these parallels further. I think that you know, I hate the narrative that that Kanye made Taylor Swift by ripping the microphone out of her hand and and saying Beyonce should have won the record, whatever. I I hate that narrative, but I do think that moment was like. Voldemort came through yep. and was trying to kill Harry before Harry came over and got the best of him. And I think that it had the opposite effect. It killed Kanye and Kanye has yeah. been trying to gain speed or gain steam, whatever. And Taylor's been, you know, preparing for battle for her whole fucking life. And she's crushing him into the ground right now. We're, we're yeah. in death yeah. part two right now. I don't, I don't even know though, if you could say that there's exactly parallels between them now, like within their oh, careers, no. like she does something. Yeah. Because I feel like, the the VMAs thing happened, then the whole voicemail thing happened, and now look at where Kanye West is. He's being a freak in the streets of Italy with his crazy <laughs> wife. Like I don't <laughs> even know. Yeah, and on on naked it, all the time. On a, like, yeah, yeah, on an heiress tour internationally sell, as a billionaire, selling out every single show. Like yes, at a certain point, I think that their careers had parallels, but now like, I think they're in completely different. Oh yeah, no, no more no, no, yeah. I mean more like the I mean more the the tit for tat. Like yeah, Taylor won. Yeah. Taylor Taylor won oh, this yeah. and and won the war. We're Deathly Hallows Part Two. Kanye West is, yeah. is floating off into a million different <laughs> dust yeah. particles and you know, never to be seen again. Like that's I, mean, I, I yeah. just I feel like that's what's happened. I'm but not you- gonna lie. What back to the meltdown question, I did think that Maddie Healy thing we were gonna see what was soon to be a meltdown that it was been, like it could if she if she let her if she distanced herself from her family and her friends and stuff yeah i mean that's fucking crazy but that's what happens when you if you're yeah. dating a, a, a person that's t- you know is toxic like that he's a little toxic i think if you're dating someone who's like that the first sign of that being a bad idea is if they start if you start isolating yourself from your friends and family and i don't mm-hmm. think that any of her friends and family, especially her mother, she's so close with, I don't think that would ever even get to that point. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think anybody yeah. would let that happen just as like people, you know what I mean? Not even just like the industry, but like 
her mother's going to be like, hey, girl, you're you're drinking too much with Maddie Healy and you look like an asshole. You know? Can I just can I just okay. say that no one on this conversation other than me is allowed to say things like, oh, the royal family in England. So silly. Why do they keep talking about them? Because this is fucking <laughs> like every now and then I step outside myself and like listen to this conversation. It is fucking crazy, you guys. Oh, it's fucking crazy. Like the I, amount... I, I like to talk about the royal family. <laughs> well, Johnny's English, kind of. No, I know. I'll talk about it all day. It's, but I, that's the thing, though. It's like people, you you get excited and you get obsessed with these people and their stories, and you you can forget that they're real people with real lives, and these things don't yeah. happen. It isn't, just, it isn't just folklore. It isn't just fairy tale. Like It is the reality for these people, and it's and when you think about it like that, that is what makes me start spinning out. I'm like, I can't believe that. Like Sometimes yeah. I, think, I wake up, and I'm like, how does Taylor Swift even wake up in the morning? Like How do you wake yeah. up in the morning and do your job? Like She's walking around the streets in New York. She can't even walk from a car to a recording studio without a thousand people gathered around to see what she's up to. Like I, that amount of fame is, is like, gives me crippling anxiety. It's like, I like to think about people like Taylor Swift going through everyday inconveniences. Like, I just like to think about like Taylor Swift walks to her car and she had been in the coffee shop for three minutes, but comes out and there's a parking ticket. Like, how does she react to that? Like, I like to think about like (laughs) random shit that would annoy me, but Dante, I have to say this. I just had like a minor panic attack and you can watch back the film. And I kind of, we were talking about the Alex Jones thing and like how she's like, yeah, well, he's a Nazi now. And I was like, yeah. And out of nowhere, I hear Dante go, guys, guys. And I was like, whoa, is he about to fucking back on me? Oh, no, no, no. And I, I literally went, what? And then you were like, no, but Taylor. And I was like, oh my God, thank you fucking God. No, dude. I I know, I got- you never know. Don- Jesus, you never know man. Don- dude, I don't know. more credit than that. I am, but I know, I know you love your tinfoil hat, dog. I know you do. Just but- for the, can we, for the record, as the first podcast I ever came on, I was talking shit about Kanye West. You were. With you guys, like, and my main complaint with him still is he's fucking boring, and that, like, I wish <laughs> isn't it Voldemort's the one where you're like they can't say his name, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, I wish he was more like Voldemort in that sense. Like, you don't say his name anymore. His name's Yay now. Yeah. You know, well, whatever his name is, just like who, like, really fucking stop. Who cares? I think yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. It's like he. I don't remember. I was you know, a loose fan of Kanye, but never a, like a major, major fan, but I still don't, uh, I never felt like he was as big, maybe for a couple of years, he had like a really, a really big run there, but I don't think that he's ever been this famous. You know what I mean? Like people mm-hmm. aren't lining up down the block to watch him go to the store. You know what I mean? Right. Like that's, that's, that's just a, a level that I don't know anybody at the moment more than Taylor Swift that that would even happen to. It's still my favorite art, like still like and I'm never going to stop like, cause I'm not a liar. I'm never a liar. Yeah. 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 Like still You're my right. like favorite records. First record I ever bought was Kanye, whatever. Yeah. Past yeah. the point. I got to a point a couple years ago where I had to have a conversation with myself and say, I can't give a fuck what a grown man has to say enough that it will control my happiness, which is exactly what you guys do with Taylor Swift. So yeah. it is this weird fucked up correlate between fan bases and shit. We all, we're all fucked. It's basically mm-hmm. what it is. <laughs> you you develop these these attachments, you know what I mean? And it's yeah. it's they bring you through hard things. And I G and I were talking about this on our last episode. We were saying uh Gia said how you know you, you can't believe how much you can relate and how she can just Taylor Swift specifically can just really drive a point home and and make you feel like you're heard through her words and all these things. And, mm. and that's what we've been saying forever. Like she is so relatable. She understands the human experience. She, and, and it's crazy to think, how is that possible when she is so famous? Like how is she yeah. you know, yeah. writing just... songs about, you know, your roommate's cheap ass screw top rosé on the floor? Like has Taylor ever had a screw top bottle of rosé in her life? Like apparently, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. you know what I mean? Like that's- Probably owns several about. companies that yeah, make she... screw top <laughs> right, rosé. Right. I don't yeah. think she's that like un- relatable i don't think she's like at the end of the day you think that she would be because she's so famous you think that she would right but end of the day she's still raised by you know upper middle class middle class like parents she grew up in like a normal town like she wasn't she's not like northwest like Mm. northwest kanye and kim's kids are (laughs) never going to be able to fucking relate to any normal fucking behavior have you seen the story going around about Kanye's kid ripping 
Kim to shreds because she likes living with Kanye more. Yes, I did. I did do that. She <laughs> likes. She likes to go because she likes his apartment and she likes. She thinks that like it's too much with Kim and all them and whatever. And she likes to hang out with Kanye because it's kind of like we're just bumming around in my apartment, no cameras, just chilling. Which I, I mean, of course, if you're a kid, like it, your your mom is Kim Kardashian. You, it's nonstop, twenty four seven. You don't get a break. Like I well, guess yeah. sure. the the that doesn't necessarily mean that. Like, I, I can't wait ten years from now to tell my daughter she can't watch. <laughs> Kim Kardashian's kids, fucking Kardashians, forty five or whatever <laughs> yeah. the fuck it's on. I mean, I I worry about this as a new parent, how my son is going to live growing up with all these cameras in our house and you know the constant paparazzi around. I just don't know how he's going to handle it. Like, I, I really do. I get worried about this kind of shit. You know what I mean? It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for you, girls. What I need to get your uh, I need to get your honest on the record thoughts and predictions about first off what. Do you truly think is going on with this Travis Kelsey thing? Do you think this is legit? Do you think it's half legit? Do you think it's total bullshit? And what do you think is going to happen with it? Well, I think the the relationship is real. I think that everything that has come with it, the NFL stuff, like blah, blah, whatever. I think it's just people taking advantage of a convenient situation. Like, oh, wow, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey are dating. All right, let's like, let's you know, strike while the iron's hot. Let's make everything about Taylor Swift. Let's capitalize on the the female demographic that's not watching football. Let's this, that, whatever. And then on Travis Kelsey's side with his, you know, stupid ass publicist, that's just, I don't know. Well, we haven't heard anything, by the way. Like we've heard not, this is the slowest week in Taylor Swift news history. And I don't- yeah. I don't think it's a coincidence that all this shit went down on Sunday with with Travis Kelsey's publicist. I think that this is very intentional. And I think it goes to show that when Taylor wants to be seen and when she's playing along, she's playing along. And when she's not, she's not. And we're not talking about it. So I think that, in in my opinion, the control is always in her hands and everything that she was doing was up to her. And I do think that, you know, it was a, a there were some there are some mutually beneficial aspects to this relationship, but I do think the relationship is real. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I, you know, like Kelly said, the NFL benefits from it. Taylor Swift benefits from it, but at, at the end of the day, they don't need each other. Like Taylor Swift doesn't need any PR or whatever from Travis Kelsey or the NFL and the NFL doesn't need PR from Taylor Swift. Like they are doing just fine without her with or without her. Yeah. So to me, it just, when people say like, oh, this is a PR relationship, it just doesn't really make sense to me. I think right. the NFL definitely, like Kelly said, like they definitely suck up to Taylor Swift. They want her to probably do the halftime show. So they put her commercials out. They they show her all the time. They want to yeah. have a good relationship. But there's there's no thought in my mind that says like, oh, they they are together for PR or whatever it is they it, it just seemed and I I mean I I've always been like the number one fan of their relationship like the second yeah, that I had, it took me a minute to come around I had to come yeah. around but but she has always, like been, when, always been at the front yeah I don't know I just feel like they're so cute and they they just make sense to me I just love the idea of like the football star with the pop star I think it's very cute and yeah I I with the exactly like the PR like the publicist stuff like even Travis, like it's been in the news a little bit that Travis has been copyright, copywriting or whatever the term is, like certain phrases of his. Like, trademarking. Killer trademarking. Trav. Yeah, trademarking. Yeah. yeah. Like Killer Trav and All Right Now and whatever his other things. So, <laughs> you know, they're learning from each other. He's taking a play out of her book and, and trademarking things and they, they their relationship definitely benefits off of each other for sure. I think I, and I, think I saw I that they're tweet, just so yeah. cute. The tweet yeah. about uh, about all of his all of the things he's trademarking and someone was like, yeah. oh, she's teaching him capitalism. Yeah, yeah I was yeah, gonna yeah, say yeah, yeah. their That's pillow hilarious. talk is their pillow talk is literally next level. It's like, hey, if you diversify, what are we doing here? Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah. Do you think yeah. the PR <laughs> agents are in there for the pillow talk? <laughs> right, right. Honestly, yeah. when, you, when you think about it, though, it does make sense. Like they even in that way, like they're both extremely passionate, driven people, and they both are in the in the middle of like you know, building these empires for themselves. Like, I don't think that, uh, you know, uh, 
the podcast with his brother, New Heights, that was already taken off, already doing really well. That stuff's going on. So he's entering this new world of a different kind of fame, of pop culture fame versus Mm -hmm. just being a popular sports player. And I think that, uh, you know, Taylor's an expert, you know, and I think that if I'm sure he can learn a lot from her, I'm sure she can, you know, get an insight as to what it's like to be, you know, coming up in the pop culture space now versus when she, you know, started when she was so much younger. I think that it's, it's probably fascinating. And I honestly would love to be like sitting in on one of those. studying him. That's what you're saying. Well, yeah, exactly. He's a a science experiment. Her brother. A little bit, a little bit. Her brother is my favorite athlete. Like, but I have multiple Jason Kelsey jerseys upstairs. Oh, Jason Kelsey. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love Jason Kelsey. I love him too. To death. It's gotten to the point now where I hate that fucking word, Kelsey. I hear it too much. Like, I'm yeah. burnt out. I wear that jersey all the time, and I can't even look at myself because I've just heard the word Kelsey nine million fucking times throughout the week. So it's it's jamming me up, dude. It's jamming me up. It's a lot. <laughs> but I think, you know, they're, they're the same thing. Like, they they have this family unit. They're all, you know, the, the brother rivalry in the Super Bowl, and they have the show, and they've got the mom, and, the, and the, you know, Jason's kids. And it's, it's a very... Um, it's a very healthy family dynamic that people like to see. And mm-hmm. I think that's why people are so drawn to it. And then I, I think we said this too, Gia, on the, on the show the other day, that this relationship between Travis and Taylor is like a healthy relationship if we're getting down to it. You know what I mean? It's two successful yeah. people who respect each other, who want nothing but the best for each other. Who, the way that Travis speaks about Taylor is unlike anybody that's ever really spoken yeah. about her. That's not just in passing. And um, and Taylor, you know, is obviously supportive of him, like all these things. So it's, yeah, people are fascinated. He's, just, he's a good dude, man. I, um, <laughs> I used to fucking hate the guy because- I, I didn't he, like him either. Bronx, I, thought he was, Bronx, I thought he was full of himself, you know? Like I thought he was listen, like a little- Oh, Gronk's my guy. Um, I from day one was on the defense thinking like there's no way this guy's as good as Gronk and everything he does is trying to be like Gronk and even you know pick the same number, blah blah blah. And then you would see him nowhere near the amount of as much as you do now. And whenever you would see him, he was just acting like a clown. Yeah, um, hundred percent. That's how I thought he was. I thought he was a clown when I when I heard about. it, I was like, that fucking clown. Like, please. And then I met him this summer. He's from Cleveland. He came to my club a bunch of times this summer. He's actually, which this is the most random thing. He's really good friends with Dom Dalla. Oh, really? One of the one why. of the biggest DJs in the world right now. Yeah, he's from Australia. Yeah. I don't know how him and Travis Kelsey know each other, but Kelsey showed up with Dom Dalla, kind of like incognito unannounced uh didn't make a big deal out of himself wasn't like i need security or anything like that super fucking cool down to earth humble took Uh a million pictures with people that came up to him signed a million things um just really really gracious uh you can wait is this pre or pre or post taylor thing this is pre. This is this. Mm-hmm. This is this past summer, and I remember being oh. like, "Fuck, I fucking like this guy now." <laughs> um, yep. And then he, yeah, then he started dating my dream girl, and now I don't know what to think. But are you gonna lure him back to your club this summer, and then have like a fucking old school duel with him? Like you pull a white glove out and smack him? And so try how and do like... you how do you think this came about? Because I remember seeing when she was single, he like floated out something like. You know, the, I want, the friendship I, bracelet, Dante. He went to her, uh, you know, yeah. she played at Arrowhead and he brought a friendship bracelet with his. Well, I was actually confused, Gia. We haven't discussed this. Um, he said <laughs> that he brought a friendship bracelet with his number with on his it. Number. I yeah. thought it was his phone number. People are thinking it was his jersey number. Oh, but I don't know what. I, but if it was phone number, like on the phone, I was like, "That's a slick move." I really I like that. Yeah. Apparently, he was move. hoping that maybe he'd be able to meet her afterwards, but she didn't like meet with anybody. So he talked about it on the podcast and said, "I'm a little salty." You know, I know Taylor's single, and I brought a friendship bracelet with my number on it. I was gonna give it to her, and I'm kind of sad. And then after that, you know, things started going into motion. Like I'm sure somebody yeah. got in touch with somebody, and then they, you know, started chatting. And then like a month later is when um, we start seeing these like soft news articles from this random outlet called The Messenger, which I had never heard of before, yeah. which now seems to be 
like uh like the first place that has Taylor Swift news. Like they are always in the. I mix wonder of- if there is an anonymous holding company that somebody owns. <laughs> could be. Honestly, could be. Like that's no bullshit. Like I, it, it was so random. Like so much so that when I saw the report from the Messenger the first time, I went, "That's bullshit," and I didn't even think about blogging. I didn't even think about talking about it. We had a quick discussion in the office about it. Dave happened to be there. We were all like, "Yeah, yeah, that's bullshit." And then like one day later, it was it was everywhere. Keys, can you do me a favor? Can you turn yeah. your camera to the left and show me the wall with the giant cork board with the fucking uh, yarn and like the <laughs> arrows pointing in different directions like Pepe Silvia? You no, no, this no. Shit. I don't, I don't want to show you because I don't want to get arrested. Of course not, dude. There's, <laughs> there's just like random napkins that Taylor Swift has used at different places on the wall and shit like that. I don't know. I love having you guys on. Your seat's always open. Uh, whenever there's a breaking re-release or some crazy shit happens, you guys should come on. We should find a way to re-record what we did in New York and try I and- love that. It'd be so I fun. think we It'd should re-record this podcast word for word <laughs> <laughs> and do a re-release like five years from now. That's a great yeah. idea, actually. <laughs> Transcribe Damn. it, practice. Yeah, what for are like your guys? Three, is, what, three do months? you guys have have rules with this? Like, are you going to lock us in? We can't we can't re-record this for thirty yeah. years. Yeah, I mean, we do have our our attorney on the other line. It's White Sox Dave is our attorney, so you guys are probably. <laughs> of course, I figured. Yeah, it's ri- it's written in Crown, like it's just it's, it's exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll fucking do this again. You guys are always welcome. Everybody go subscribe to Taylor Watch. Uh there's Thank always you. shit happening. So there's yes. honestly, I think the biggest thing out of this is to me now I can't stop thinking of Kanye West's Voldemort. That's literally the only thing I can do. <laughs> Voldemort. He's Voldemort. He's Sorry Voldemort. about it. Yeah. Uh Gia Kelly. Thank you guys. We'll see you soon. You guys right? are awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. See ya.